So before we get to 150 and before we get to what we would do post OC in a in a patient without a C797S or even a C797S, the PDL1 on this rebiopsy is 100%. Um, is there an opportunity to just give immunotherapy in this patient? Is this even a consideration? I, I wouldn't do it. Okay. Yeah, I think the retrospective data are relatively clear that even in the setting of high PDL1 expression, there's not a very good response. Yeah. I mean, I and think we. Yeah. Ahead. And so I think to, um, not to sound um, uh, sort of uh, 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 direct about this, but to sort of waste that option of yeah. immunotherapy and then to have sort of changed potentially the immune microenvironment in that way, yeah. um, I think. Uh, is it potentially a disservice to yeah. the patient based on that? I think we know that, and we talked about this earlier, treating a patient with a TKI can induce PDL1 and it can be high in these resistant settings potentially. I think we learned at ASCO this year that single agent pembrolizumab in an EGFR treatment naive patient whose PDL1 is high, the response rates are zero. Mm -hmm. Small number of patients. Uh, just recently published in the JTO, but this is something I think that the message needs to be clear. Even if the PDL1 is high, single agent checkpoint inhibitor is probably not the best drug for this patient. And there's no reason not to give them chemo plus IO. Yeah. You know, we know these mutant patients respond beautifully yeah. to systemic therapy. So in my mind, you should never use a single agent checkpoint inhibitor. So let's talk about in this patient. This patient has progressed on, or their tumor has progressed on a TKI osimertinib. You have the mutational analysis that we've uh, reviewed here. What are, what are people doing routinely. Uh, Paul, I'll start with you. What do you do off of a clinical trial for a patient like this who's symptomatic and you need to get something going on them? So here, um, I think it's down to really the individual patient approach also, because there is sort of a third option that's not mentioned, which is continuation osimertinib with chemo. Okay. And we don't really have any data about this. We do have data about continuation TKI with first generation sure. TKI, but we don't for osimertinib. Yeah. And I think it's fair to say that the biology is sufficiently undefined, but also different from that resistance after first generation TKI, where it's a question that we do need an answer to and we should try to get an answer to. What chemo? Uh, so I still you know, go for carbopem uh, bev as the standard uh, to give these patients. The Empire 150 data are interesting. Um, I still have not sort of utilize that for the osimertinib progressors uh, at this point, and I don't know uh, at this point what it will take to get me <laughs> to utilize it. Um, what about the 189 regimen? And yeah, and so that again I think is interesting. Part of my concern uh, again about this is uh, conceptualizing in the long run the role of immunomodulation and what the best strategic approach is going to be. And I think you have to be very careful about that and not sort of using things. It's there as a standard. There might be better options. Um, and, and I think it's just something we have to think about carefully when it comes to that. Um, it's sort of the best answer I can give. And I think right now the only data that we have, of course, is Zion Power 150 with the quadruplet regimen because that is the only trial in frontline that allowed EGFR mutants who were previously treated with an EGFR TKI um, onto. So that is the only data. So in theory, that would be the regimen that people would want to move towards if they fail uh, ozomertinib. Now with that said, in my clinical practice, I give carbopem pembro okay. um, because the taxing is hard. Yeah. You know, and I used to be, just like Paul, I used to give carbopem bev, yeah. you know, to my EGFR mutants. So for me, it's not much of a leap to switch out the bev. Yeah. Um, but, but there is emerging data, with, the, with that caveat said, there is emerging data that anti-angiogenics and immunotherapies interact on the tumor microenvironment and that there's a synergistic effect and that there may be something additive there that we're not aware of yet that specifically benefits this population of patients who have oncogenic driver mutants. Uh, so I, that, that was very nicely laid out. I think the options for patients, I think there's a lot of scientific rationale by combining PD checkpoint inhibitor with an anti-angiogenesis drug. 
I hope that we'll have regimens that are routinely used soon and we can get some generation of data post OC. Um, I'm, I, I have a, a crisis at times at work trying to know what to use in this patient. Do I use the carbo uh, pem bev or do I go with carbo pem pem? 189 didn't allow EGFR mutant lung cancer patients. We think that BEV may have some activity in EGFR mutant lung cancer. I think it's dealer's choice. I think it's not really ironed out. I hope that the, the that we'll see more and more data with the quadruplet based on the scientific rationale and that you just, just laid out. I think we're still trying to struggle with what to do. One of the concerns I have that plays into this is what happens if you have that patient where you take them off osimertinib and you start some chemo-based regimen, and it becomes evident that they're one of those patients who ends up having some degree of progression that you think might be because you took off osimertinib. What is the ability then to add back osimertinib? And so one of the things that's always, right, but one of the things that's always in the back of my mind is if you're giving an immunotherapy-based chemo regimen now, right, then the concern about pneumonitis yeah. in that setting is much higher. And so how does that, uh, you know, temper how you think about things or play into how you think about things. So it is, I think what's emerging is that it's not, there's no straightforward answer and that there are big data gaps here yeah. in terms of uh, how to go forward. Yeah, I think that, you know, hopefully we'll have more data very soon. So, you know, in summary, I think uh, that we've witnessed a tremendous amount of progress, uh, not only in all non-small cell lung cancer, but particularly for each of our mutant lung cancer. If we would have had this discussion 12 months, a year ago, we would not be able to even have these data points. So who knows what we're going to see in the next 12 to 24 months. It's very exciting. Thank you to Dr. Riedlinger, Dr. Pack, and Dr. So for your thoughtful case presentations and a lively, informative discussion. To our viewing audience, thank you for joining us for this Targeted Oncology Virtual Tumor Board presentation. We hope today's discussion was a valuable use of your time and that you acquired some practical knowledge that you can take back to your clinic.